stories of people, culture, and nature on a thrilling eight-day journey through China's vast high-speed rail network. Setting off from the Chinese capital to down south in Guangzhou, Shanghai on the east, as well as nearby Zhangjiakou, its partner for the Winter Olympics. Plus, a visit to the roof of the world, aboard the world's highest railway, from glitzy metropolis to vast plains and rugged mountains. Join CGTN on a fast motion journey, exploring China's beauty and diversity for an experience like no other. Starting October 1st. Right, today marks the first day of China's National Day holiday, also known as Golden Week. And this year's holiday is one day longer than usual, as Mid-Autumn Festival also falls on October the 1st. And Chinese tourists are eager to travel during the eight-day holiday, and train is, of course, one of the most popular choices of transportation. So starting from today, CGTN will take you on the thrilling eight-day journey through China's high-speed rail network. Our reporters on four different routes will bring you stories of people, culture and nature. I'm CGTN reporter Zhou Yaxin and I'll bring you stories from my train journey with some health workers who fought COVID-19 in central China's Wuhan. Join me on my return to the city. From Beijing to Shanghai in just four and a half hours. By way of the fastest train in the world. We'll take you to experience the heartbeat of China's most cosmopolitan city. And experience the sights and sounds of some of the most amazing sights along the way. I'm Sun Sun Wiscott, and I will be traveling from Qinghai to Tibet on the highest railway in the world, bringing you spectacular landscapes and stories of amazing engineering along the way. I'm now on a smart high-speed train on Jinjiang Railway. This is where history intertwines with the future. All right, before we start our train journey, here's some news from China. Thursday marks 71 years since the founding of the People's Republic of China, and the State Council on Wednesday held a National Day reception in Beijing. President Xi Jinping and other high-level officials attended, as well as nearly 500 guests from home and abroad. Premier Li Keqiang addressed the event. He said, uh, facing the COVID-19 outbreak and the global economic recession, China has achieved major strategic results. And Li underscored uh, consistent reforms and opening up. He also called for efforts to fully and faithfully implement one country, two systems. And on Taiwan, Li urged the efforts to uphold the One China Principle and the 1992 consensus to firmly oppose and deter any Taiwan separatist activities and external interference. Now, Chinese people have an eight-day holiday break this year and the traditional mid-autumn festival falls on National Day. Parks and tourist sports welcome visitors with pandemic preventative measures in place. And in Shanghai's Forest Park, reservations are required, so are health codes and temperature checks. Visitor flow is limited to 75% of capacity. And in East China's Nanjing, museums plan to extend hours into the evening. And this is to reduce visitor numbers during daytime. The city also expands uh, pedestrian streets and opens more outdoor facilities. And in central China's Wuhan, one of its famous pedestrian streets is also open to the public. Uh, besides the Spring Festival, the Golden Week holiday is a peak travel period across China. And this year, from September the 28th to October the 8th, railway authorities expect an average of over 9 million passenger trips per day, totaling to at least 108 million trips for the set period. A National Day rush on October the 1st will see about 13 million trips, a record high since the coronavirus outbreak. An addition of 1,200 trains will be put into service, bringing the total number of trains to 9,500 per day to meet the travel rush. And China has been committed to expanding its transport network during its current five-year plan. Its high-speed rail system is expected to reach 
38,000 kilometers by the end of this year, double its length in 2015. And over the past five years, the government's uh, average annual investment on railway infrastructure per year was uh, 800 billion yuan. The high-speed rail network covers most of the country and it helps people reach large cities in a much quicker time. And the network not only enhances transportation capacity across the country, but also provides support for economic development. And China's high-speed railway network is the biggest in the world, covering over 35,000 kilometers. China has as much high-speed rail track as the rest of the world combined. But it does not stop there. Wang Qiao tells us about the plans for further expansion. Despite its already large capacity, Chinese authorities continue to look for ways to expand the country's high-speed rail network. A 2016 national plan extended it from the original 4 plus 4 structure into an 8 plus 8. That essentially means by 2030, there should be 8 horizontal and 8 vertical corridors. The longest is the new Eurasia Continental Bridge passageway connecting Lianyungang in Jiangsu province to Urumqi in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. It passes through the cities of Xuzhou, Xi'an, Lanzhou, and Xining, connecting the country's east all the way to the northwest. Another example, the Beijing to Hong Kong corridor connects cities in a north to south direction. There's also a proposal for a branch leading from Hefei and ending in Taipei via a tunnel under the Taiwan Strait. The new network will bring drastic cuts in intercity travel times across the country. By 2035, the entire rail network is expected to reach 200,000 kilometers, and the high-speed network should double to 70,000 kilometers. This means the network will then link almost all large and medium-sized cities. From special materials for train tracks to intelligent operating systems, Technology has a crucial role to play in China's 8 plus 8 high-speed rail network, which, once completed, will serve as a vital part of China's socio-economic development. Now China's high-speed rail network has embarked on a path of independent innovation. It's caught up with and uh, surpassed the world's most advanced players in many technical aspects. And here are some of the factors that enabled this rapid growth. The launch of the Fuxing, the first Chinese-developed high-speed train, marked a significant milestone. Its core technologies and the number of patents it generated show China's path to independent innovation. Here we have the car body, a towed vehicle designed to move along a railway track. The major technologies here involve how to make it lighter, using new materials and new structures. China's number of patent applications for the car body has mushroomed since 2006 and has led to a rapid growth in global applications. Moving along, we have the bogey. It's a frame onto which the wheels of the railway vehicle are fixed. It's used to facilitate movement on curved tracks. The main research also focuses on methods of making it safer and lighter. The number of bogey-related patent applications by China made up more than half the world's total in 2010. And now we come to the Train Control and Management System, or TCMS. It's often referred to as the train's brain. That's because of its key role in controlling the train's traction, braking, bogies, doors, and air conditioning. The trend in patent applications on TCMS since 2008 has also been dominated by China. From the overall number of related patent applications, we can see the trend of technology concentration, and it shows that China has caught up quickly by importing as well as developing its own high-speed rail technology starting from 2004. And now we have uh, Claire Pearson joining us online. She's the president of the China Britain Belt and Road Chamber of Commerce. Uh, welcome to the world today, Claire. Uh, you worked in China for for a while, have you ever traveled by railway, high-speed trains here? How was the experience? Yeah, thank you for having me here today on your national day. Um, I travel by train regularly, uh, like a, a typical business person who works in China. It has completely transformed the way I operate. I um, work as a lawyer and my job is to go and meet clients. And the thing about the train, the way that it's really changed it, when I arrive at a client meeting 
I don't want the wear and tear of travel behind me. I want to have the relaxation and time to repair my mind. It's not about how many meetings you have in China. It's about how many um, meetings of mind you can cultivate. So you have to be relaxed when you arrive. And that's why I use the train. Um, I'm based in Beijing. Um, I can cycle for 30 minutes to, to Beijing South Railway, and it just takes me four hours to get to Shanghai. But the difference is before I arrive for that meeting in Shanghai, I can be working solidly for four hours on the train. I can be taking phone calls or I can be pre-meeting the client on the train. The train has actually become one of the key meeting rooms in China because we call it uh, meals and deals on wheels <laughs> because the, the trains are very comfortable and they're conducive to working quietly with either on your laptop, on your phone or with your client in a sort of meeting environment. So when you arrive in Shanghai, you're already on top of your game uh, and ready to win your deal. The other area where I use the train a lot and my brother's been able to build the business because he, he was working in Shanghai and could open a tech company in Hangzhou because he could attract people from Shanghai to work in Hangzhou because of the high speed rail connection only taking a couple of hours. So for me, it's about two things. It's about economic stimulus and social inclusion. I heard 1.1 billion trips were taken in 2015. And, and the one thing I really like about the train is its consistency and reliability, mm. because this allows me to say to a client exactly what minute I will arrive in Shanghai, Hangzhou, Wuhan. It will allow me to say exactly when I'll be at the desk in Nanjing, because the trains leave when they say they're going to leave. They arrive when they say they're going to arrive. And you don't have that wear and tear of flight and road travel. Mm. So your brain is in a good condition to operate effectively in the meeting. Right, trains uh, apparently have become a, a better choice for a lot of people. And uh, uh, just like you, they are using the trains as meeting rooms as well, uh, or as a commune uh, transportation. But let's uh, see from a larger picture here. Uh, uh, what do you think the general construction and planning of China's uh, express trains? To be frank, it's phenomenal. I've been cr traveling across China for 20 years consistently by train. Um, and the biggest change between 2000 uh, to 2010, um, it was sort of hard work. But 2010 to 2020, it has been completely different because China has the engineering capacity to build a railway that is smooth, fast and cost effective that no other country has. And so, I mean, China, I mean, it has been able to build on the roof of the world. I heard that joining up, uh, you know, you can get to Lhasa now, which requires sort of permafrost engineer technology that other countries just don't have. I mean, similarly, um, I was born in Zambia and they built the Tanzan railway there. So China's been building good railways for a long time. It's drawing on 50 years uh, technology development. And I think the most important thing is that China has just built across a continent. So it's just upgraded its own network um, across the whole of China. So it's developed the technology on the job. There's nothing like uh, learning from doing. And China has performed engineering feats that I think will, will enable it to take this railway technology around the world. I was just reading that it's possible they could build across the Bering Strait. So maybe we can get from London to New York by train, thanks to Chinese engineers. I would like that. Mm. It's low carbon. It's socially inclusive. And it's a good price. Mm. And for women traveling on their own, it's completely safe. Mm. So there's a lot to be said for the train in the climate change migratory era. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Claire Pearson, the president of China, Britain, Belt and Road Chamber of Commerce. Now, today, we, uh, like we mentioned just now, begin an eight-day special series, China Express. We tour the country on bullet trains. take the world's longest high-speed rail from Beijing to Guangzhou in the south. From Beijing to the financial hub Shanghai, we ride on China's busiest fast train. And from Beijing to is a co-host of the 2022 Winter Olympics, Zhang Jiako, we take the world's fastest autonomous bullet train. In the west, the heavenly road runs from Xining in Qinghai province to Lhasa in Tibet. And today we travel from Beijing to Guangzhou, stretching nearly 2,300 kilometers. Uh, the Beijing-Guangzhou line is the world's longest 
high-speed railway with an average speed of over 300 kilometers per hour. And the line has a drastically reduced travel time between the two cities to just eight hours. And along the way, we'll visit the city of uh, Wuhan. It's a major transport hub in central China. It was also the epicenter of China's coronavirus outbreak earlier this year. We'll find out what life has been like since then. And now let's uh, look at Beijing Guangzhou High Speed Railway, which uh, connects one third of China's population. Since it opened in December 2012, millions of passengers have found that their hometowns are not so far away after all. If you want to witness the Four Seasons changes one day, hop on the Beijing Guangzhou High Speed Railway. It's China's longest north south train route with a total length of nearly 2,300 kilometers. It also holds the record for operating the longest mileage in the world. It runs through six provinces, 28 cities, and seven regions. Where your journey takes off from Beijing, the train traverses the vast North China Plain, then crosses China's two major rivers, the Yellow River and the mighty Yangtze. In spring, the temperature varies from warm temperature to subtropical. The landscape transforms from deciduous, broadleaf forests to evergreen ones, from plains to low hills. If you take the train in winter, you will catch snow in the morning and green trees by evening. In the 1970s, Beijing to Guangzhou took nearly 38 hours on the express train, which traveled at 60 kilometers per hour, but thankfully been cut short thanks to the high-speed rail's top speed of 350 kilometers per hour, and that can rival the speed of a brand new Ferrari. Until the high-speed rail was inaugurated, many migrant workers from across China only return home once or twice a year. And now, they can return home more frequently as they better connected with their family members. And in Wuhan, an important stop on the Beijing-Guangzhou railway was a hit hard earlier this year when the COVID-19 first emerged there. And one doctor in the eastern city of Nanjing is taking the high-speed train to revisit the city where he once risked his life fighting the virus. And this time he says he wants to see how Wuhan is recovering. Our reporter Zhou Jiaxin is with him. I'm one of nearly 100 million train travelers during the National Day holiday starting from October 1st. And I'm setting up for Nanjing South Railway Station in the capital city of East China's Jiangsu province. On the very first day of CGTN's eight long China Express series, it's my privilege to join some local health workers on a train journey to central China's Wuhan, once the city hardest hit by the coronavirus, where they fought COVID-19 for more than two months. And it's a great opportunity for us to revisit these frontliner stories and find out how they're feeling right now. And I'm pleased to be joined by Dr. Jialing, who was among more than 42,000 uh, medical personnel from across the country deployed to Wuhan soon after the outbreak. So, Mr. Jia, uh, back in January, um, you left for Wuhan from this station. And what's the difference between then and now? Uh, so back in January, in January, the time was tight and the future situation in Wuhan was unknown. My mood at the time was quite uneasy. I didn't know what would happen in the future and I didn't know if I could come back again. Now the epidemic situation in China is under control. I feel very thrilled, relaxed and happy to have such an opportunity to go back to Wuhan and visit the doctors whom I worked with back then, especially during the National Day holiday and the Mid-Autumn Festival. So, for this trip, actually, what the most you look forward to uh, on this trip? Uh, the thing I want to do the most is visit the doctors with whom I fought COVID-19, as well as tour around the city and eat local cuisine. When we fought the virus back then, we didn't see each other's faces because we all wore masks. So I want to have a look at their faces this time. I also want to visit the Yellow Crane Tower, the Yangtze River Bridge, and some light shows at night. I want to have a good tour of the city, have some local cuisine, and feel the life there after the city gets back to normal. So we, we will get there soon because the trip will take less than three hours to Wuhan. And I know that some medical uh, families also actually with the medical staff uh, on this trip. As you mentioned, this is uh, the this year's Mid-Autumn Day also actually the Chinese traditional celebration for 
uh, family reunion also falls on the same day as National Day, so that um, we will be able to catch up with some of them uh, while we are on the train. And earlier, Dr. Jialing shared with us his experience in fighting COVID-19 in Wuhan. After Wuhan was locked down on January 23rd, our hospital set up an emergency team to isolate those with fever. I was the first to sign up. On that day, the hospital also asked me if I was willing to join the Jiangsu medical team supporting Wuhan. I signed up immediately. On the 25th, we set off for Wuhan. To be honest, the unknown origin and strong contagiousness of this disease made me worry. But on the other hand, as a professional medical staff, we defeated SARS before. I believe that our country could also overcome this disease this time. The first batch of 147 medical team members from Jiangsu province to support Wuhan were confirmed on January 23rd. After two days of preparation, we set off for Wuhan on the 25th. Upon arrival, we came to the First People's Hospital of Jiangsha district. Even with the psychological preparation, the situation is still much more severe than we thought. Medical staff are exhausted, materials are extremely scarce, and the number of patients seriously exceeds the capacity of the hospital. However, with the support of national medical staff and the continuous assistance of national government, especially with the establishment of square cabin hospitals, the situation has greatly improved by early February. To be honest, we hope to reunite with our family, but we must ensure the situation in Wuhan is under control. Then it is the final victory. I really hope that we can return to Wuhan again to meet colleagues who were working side by side at the time. I hope next time I can enjoy the food and beauty of Wuhan. Well, when disaster strikes, help comes from all quarters. After the coronavirus outbreak, the entire country acted promptly as support was mustered to assist Hubei and particularly Wuhan to combat the disease. The Lunar New Year was approaching. It was business as usual at train stations in Wuhan, as authorities dealt with a large amount of traveling associated with that time of the year. A silent killer had been spreading through the city. Heavily disguised as a bad cold with an unpredictable incubation period, the novel coronavirus hit hard and fast. On January 23rd, Wuhan was locked down, as authorities looked to contain the spread as best they could. Work began immediately to treat thousands who were reporting symptoms, and to learn more about this killer virus. Unable to cope with strong demand, Wuhan sought help, and a national rescue operation was put in place. Two massive temporary hospitals were built from scratch in a matter of days. Over a dozen public venues were turned into makeshift medical shelters. Qualified medics were also in short supply in Wuhan. However, tens of thousands answered the call over the following weeks, coming to the embattled city from all corners of the country. Medical supplies and personal protective equipment were delivered in vast quantities. And in this rescue, China didn't stand alone. Over 200 countries, regions, and organizations lent their support to the effort. A third of them donated medical supplies, such as masks and protective suits, as well as food among other necessities. In February, to learn more about the virus, the WHO sent a team on a joint investigation to China. During their two-week stay, Wuhan turned the corner and started on a road to recovery. The head of the WHO's team explained what brought about a swift turnaround. After going through a number of calculations, our, our, our assessment is that um, this approach, what we call an all-of-government, all-of-society approach with very old-fashioned tools in some ways, has probably uh, av definitely averted and, and probably uh, uh, prevented um, at least uh, well, well, tens of thousands, but probably hundreds of thousands of cases of COVID-19 here in China which is an extraordinary achievement and so important. He also thanked Wuhan for its massive contributions and sacrifices in those early days. 
And I just thought it's so important that we recognize that. And to the people of Wuhan, um, it is recognized. The world's in your debt. And uh, when this disease finishes, hopefully we'll have a chance to thank the people of Wuhan for the role that they've played in it. Because many of us, uh, many of people here have suffered, but the people of that city have gone through an extraordinary period and they're still going through it. And there's so many stories like that. The spring brought more than just a milder weather to Wuhan. After 76 days in lockdown, the city was restarted in early April. The story of Wuhan in 2020 is indeed one of inspiration and selfless heroes, and social media platforms have acknowledged this. The sacrifices of a few saved lives of many, they said, and show that when a collective will is present, that anything is possible. While the joint efforts helped COVID-19 patients in Wuhan, a 72-year-old man who uh, recovered from the disease has traveled 1,800 kilometers to Shenyang to, in northeast China's Liaoning province to express his gratitude to the medical workers who saved his life. Let's take a look at his story.开始设计的时候是明年武汉在樱花在开放的时候就平常就已经打电话的时候就会问你啊Well, railway networks in central China's Hubei province are also gearing up for the holiday travel rush. Several batches of extra trains have been put in place since Monday in the provincial capital, Wuhan. Uh, authorities say over 1,000 additional trains will operate for the holiday season, and that's just the first batch. Most of them will service the Wuhan railway hub. Uh, while 65 more high-speed trains will be allocated for inter-provincial travel. Wuhan railway stations are expected to see nearly 6 million passenger trips throughout the holiday period. The average passenger count is anticipated to be 527,000 per day. This comes as uh, the pandemic eases throughout the Chinese mainland. And Wuhan's landmark Yellow Crane Tower receives visitors from all over China during Golden Week. The ancient structure dates back to 223 AD and is reopened after closure during the pandemic. And on the first day of the National Day holiday, our reporter Xia Rishue is at the famous site. Hello there, Rishue. So what do you have for us? Hello, Dongning. Um, I'm now standing at the Yellow Crane Tower 
or Huanghelo, is a landmark tourist attraction in Wuhan. Uh, it's one of China's three famous towers. Um, today is the National Day and Mid-Autumn Day. Uh, you may notice that people from across the country um, flocking here. They climb up to on the tower, one bring, hoping to see the beautiful view of the Yellow Crane Tower and the Yangtze River, China's longest river, and the famous Wuhan Yangtze River Bridge. That is the first bridge on the Yangtze. This morning, I met a few tourists here. I talked to them, and, and they came all the way from Beijing, from Tianjin, Changsha, Hefei, to spend the holiday. They took the high-speed train, and they told me that they want to uh, they want to uh, take a look at the Yangtze River, at the Yellow Crane Tower, some t famous tourist attractions here, and the most importantly, they want to taste the very famous hot, hot and dry noodles here. Um, so that's why they come here. According to the city's prevention and control measures, all the tourist sites should require reservations and limit visitors to no more than 50 percent of their daily capacity. In the following days of the National Day holiday, the Yellow Crane Tower is expected to see um, 37,500 uh, 37, tourists. That will be the maximum number of people it can receive to safeguard people's health. And 80 percent of this number will be uh, the, the tourists from outside of Hubei province. This August, Hubei province announced that it would offer free access to nearly 400 A-level tourist attractions across the province through the end of this year. It's their way to express their gratitude for the nation's assistance and support during the COVID-19 um, outbreak. As everybody, everybody knows that Wuhan was the former epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic in China. It lived through 76 days on lockdown. Today, when you walk down on the streets and these tourist attractions here, it's really hard to imagine what the city has gone through. We're, we're really very glad to see um, it's back to the normal, and we hope it will get better and better. Back to you, Dongli. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Xiaori Xue reporting from Wuhan. Uh, some medical doctors who helped Wuhan fight the virus are returning to the city for a visit during the holiday. Uh, and our reporter Zhou Jiaxin spoke with some of them about their feelings to be back. We're on a high-speed railway train um, bound to Wuhan and uh, we've got some time to get to know some of the medical uh, personnel on board while actually we can get some feelings about their returning. Uh, back to the former epicenter of COVID-19. So we will begin with uh, Dr. Pantran, who went to Wuhan by himself in the end of January, actually. He's also the member of health, uh, National Health Commission's team of experts. So, Dr. Pan, I'd like to know that uh, now you're on the way back to the city. You fought alongside the um, uh, local staff in two major hospitals over three months at the height of the epicenter. So what is going through your mind now? So right now, actually, compared to the very beginning in January, it's totally different. Actually, I also see at the same places, but back then, actually, it's more with a mission in mind. But right now, I look at I'm quite relaxing and cheerful with my family members to revisit Wuhan to see its full recovery. So we assisted two hospitals, CA Chinese, the traditional medicine and the Western Hospital and the first hospital in Jiangxia. And also, one of the hospitals become the very first hospital to clear off the all confirmed cases. So when I see the whole patients going back home, we were so touched and moved. Actually, they only got us when they hospitalized. Some people in the bed actually could not take care of themselves after a period of treatment and care. They went home by themselves, and actually they can reunion with their families. So actually for myself, I'm so proud of myself, I'm so excited and so gratified. Actually, I use my power to contribute to this fight. I'm so happy for them and for ourselves. I know more things that you should feel proud of, um, because, you know, the traditional Chinese medicine or TCM has played a really important role in treating COVID-19 um, and actually uh, its usefulness wasn't quite clear uh, in the beginning but actually as a, a TCM practitioner um, how did that application increase your confidence in fighting against the virus? 
talking about the, the role of TCM. So TCM not only play a key role in treating critical condition patients, but it also actually treats the a patients in the makeshift hospital with the AML symptoms, actually already proven its effectiveness in the makeshift hospitals. So TCM not only for treatment purpose, but also actually can help our patients strengthen their immune system, so make them stronger in terms of body condition. So at a very early time of COVID-19, when there were no magic bullets, so TCM actually played a key role in the early days treating the COVID-19. So that's the asset and the wisdom so of TCM. You medical workers assisting Wuhan must be very excited to go back to uh, Wuhan. So what is your plan today there? Uh, so for today, my plan is at the daytime, we travel with this high-speed train and also tour around upon our arrival. But because back then, it was totally locked down, there was no cars and the people on street. So this time, when we're going back, this is a heroic city. And our reporter Zhou Jiaxin has actually arrived at uh, Wuhan railway station now. Let's check in with him to see what's going on. Hello, Jiaxin. So what do you have for us over there? Yes, Tony, um, after about three hours from Nanjing and 470 miles by rail express, our train has just arrived in central China's Wuhan. And in our special program, China Express, I travel with healthcare workers. Uh, who came here when Wuhan was the hardest hit city by COVID-19 along with local staff. And today on National Day, uh, they've returned to meet their former colleagues and the recovered patients uh, they once treated. At this time, it's all about celebrating the memories and how they turned those serious hardship into an achievement. As you can see over there, some uh, came here earlier to welcome these special uh, visitors because uh, the coronavirus has mostly been brought under control in China. So shaking hands there, embracing each other is now possible. But none of this uh, would be possible without the efforts of these uh, healthcare workers to fight the virus. Uh, I can also imagine that what these medical staff were thinking when they arrived at Wuhan station in late January, nobody to greet them and only a few people inside and outside the station. And that's when the city was uh, put under a strict lockdown that lasted about uh, 11 weeks. And the fact is Wuhan is widely known as the thoroughfare of nine provinces and it's the main hub uh, for China's high-speed railway network that extends in all directions. Its location makes it a significant connection node uh, between um, the eastern and western parts of China and a bridge between north and south in terms of uh, industrial development. So its rail freight service is also a part of China Europe Railway Express, a key link between Europe and Asia through the Belt and Road Initiative. So all of this made the decision to completely halt the major transportation hub a hard one, but it proved to be an effective one. Since Wuhan lifted the lockdown in April, trains across the region and continent have gone all out to fully get up and running again, especially in the tourism industry. Since August, medical staff from more than 20 provinces uh, who help the city have been invited by local tourism authorities uh, to tourism spots in the province. And to boost local tourism, travelers from around the country can also enjoy free tours in these places. And in August alone, Wuhan estimates an increase of 34% in tourists year on year. So when medical workers revisit the city, they'll definitely find a place it's uh, roaring back into actions. And that's the country's railway network no doubt the best way for everyone to discover this during this year's uh, National Day holiday. Donnie. Thank you very much uh, indeed, uh, Jiaxin. Nice to see that uh, Wuhan uh, is back to normal and these people are happy about that. Thank you very much again, Zhou Jiaxin reporting from Wuhan. And uh, well indeed, along with almost every other aspect of life, the industries of central China's COVID-19 epicenter Wuhan were shut down by the pandemic for the first few months of this year, but now they are recovering as well. Uh, since April the 9th, manufacturing firms have gradually resumed production in Wuhan. Over 700,000 industrial companies are now running at full speed, especially in the high-tech manufacturing sector, which has now become the engine for Wuhan's economic recovery. 
A city authority say there was strong progress towards recovery even in the first half of the year. And the key indicator of industrial electricity consumption even increased 1% year-on-year in the second quarter. And nearly 300 industrial enterprises have exceeded growth targets, with the average value of output rising by 20.8%. And when Wuhan was put under lockdown to stop the spread of COVID-19, airways and the highways were nearly shut down and waterways became a crucial measure of transport for the virus hit city. And our reporter George Atten once again uh, talked to one crane operator at uh, Yangluo Port for his experience during, the, uh, during and also after lockdown. Waterway transport was a lifeline for Wuhan when the city was put under lockdown in late January. Xietan and his several colleagues remained operating the gantry cranes, but the workload was much smaller than they were used to. The workload just plummeted compared to the busiest period. Usually there would be non-stop work during my 12-hour shift, but it reduced to about four hours during the outbreak. Despite shorter working hours at the cabin, stress was high for She, who began his operating job 13 years ago. We got emergency orders to speed up the unloading goods from a slew of ships. It must be medical necessities, we reckoned. So we did the work safely and quickly. We certainly felt stressed, because these were meant to save lives. Aside from medical supplies such as masks, protection suits and ambulance accessories, the biggest inland port in central China continued loading other daily necessities, including import and export goods during the difficult period. That's why she feels proud of his work. It was rewarding to realize we could do our bit to at least help safeguard our nurses and doctors. This knowledge has made a big difference for She. His work got busier again after the city lifted lockdown in early April. That includes being a part of resuming the first international container carrying about 300 metric tons of anti-epidemic supplies and daily necessities to Japan in May. The port throughput in February was just one quarter that of the same period last year, and that increased to half in April. In June, the throughput rose slightly from what it was a year ago, and now continues climbing. Thus, we're confident we will achieve our output goal this year. Wuhan's industrial resumption is now in full swing, and the great demand for grain in the region is driving the port's year-end goal toward a 13% increase in throughput from last year. Yangluo Port is expected to lead more strategic integration with other ports in the Yangtze River Basin, so as to build what Chinese leaders called the Golden Waterway. Zhou Jiaxing, CGTN, Wuhan, Hubei Province. And many foreigners who work in Wuhan are also seeing their businesses up and running now. And Xia Rui tells us more stories like that. My name is Sina. I came to Wuhan uh, exactly two years ago. Two years ago, I came here for uh, studying. I really like this place as well. It's a nice place. I was living in Wuhan in a good time, in a in peaceful and happiness and everything was good here. But now Wuhan is in trouble? Why I should leave it? No, no. I'm not gonna leave it in this situation. I was really happy because I know that 
that is something that we can uh, help doctors and nurses. Maybe we can even in a small help, even just a cup of coffee. But this can make them happy, and this can show them people are watching you. People are watching you. People care about whether you are what you are doing. We did a small thing. A lot of people they did better than us. So even from now, okay, what we have done, we should forget about it and start to do more and more and work harder. Really work harder, at least one year, to make Wuhan better, to make all the city better. Our business every week is getting better but still after two months or three months of maybe 30% or 40% before the epidemic we are sure about that Wuhan will be better and better now I feel I really love this city I don't want to leave it I, I really want to stay here something good happened for me in this time so uh, I decided to stay here for a long, long time. And we are joined now online by uh, Kodai Kataoda. He's uh, the Deputy Director of the Wuhan Office of the Japan External Trade Organization. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Kataoda. Um, first of all, when did your company resume operations? How is it now in the city? Yes, uh, Wuhan is. Wuhan is home to leading domestic and multinational companies. And most businesses that were affected by the nearly three months lockdown have resumed. The recovery, both economically and socially, has been a stable path thanks to state assistance and informed public uh, that follows the government's preventive measures. In Wuhan, residents uh, flock to food markets and parks and many donning ma masks uh, despite the uh, uh, summer heat, uh, as wearing them is uh, mandatory when taking public transport and visiting malls. Uh, well, Mr. Kataoda, um, as Japanese firms in Wuhan get back to work, uh, do you still remain optimistic on the growth? Yeah, I think the uh, I think the epidemic is a short-term issue, and China, uh, China's economy will continue to grow. Uh, the outbreak may negatively affect uh, performance, uh, but I'm I'm optimistic about uh, development prospect uh, for foreign country uh, for foreign companies in China. Uh, the country uh, country uh, advocate high quality development and has issued support policies to encourage uh, consumption and. Uh, promote green development uh, as well as supply side uh, structural reforms. And uh, uh, for example, uh, when we surveyed the current situation of Japanese farms uh, in July, uh, it was revealed that almost all of them were in full operations and 90% Japanese farms were not going to change their business plans in Wuhan. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kodai Kataoda, the Deputy Director of Wuhan Office of the Japan External Trade Organization. Well, it's happy to see that everything, uh, people's life and the industries, uh, are all back to normal in Wuhan. And we believe that everything will be back to normal, back on track in the world as well. Uh, well, we will have more special coverage of our journey on the fast track later in the day. So please tune in for the world today at 5 p.m. and China 24 at 15 past 8 p.m. Beijing time to see how life is recovering from the pandemic in Wuhan. You can also scan the QR code on the screen for more on the CGTN app. And to end our special coverage of China Express, we take you to a flash mob at Wuhan Railway Station where residents gathered and sang My Motherland to express their love for China on National Day. The tune is a beautiful folk song and remains very popular to this day.
高山好水。Let's take a look at some international news. The U.S. Supreme Court's new term begins on October the 3rd, subject to her confirmation, Conservative Judge Amy Coney.